President Trump put Salvadoran immigrants on the clock. Immigration takes center stage in government shutdown talks. Plus, what really is going on with the Iranian protests? This is Special Report. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. More than 200,000 Salvadoran immigrants could be forced to leave the U.S. by September of next year. That, as the Trump administration is pulling what's known as temporary protected status for residents from El Salvador who came to the U.S. after devastating earthquakes in 2001. The move, sparking some heated reaction from administration critics, comes as the Trump administration and Congress are working on new legislation to avoid another threatened government shutdown in just 11 days. And there, too, immigration emerging as the key issue. We have Fox team coverage. Mike Emanuel is on Capitol Hill to tell us where we are in the government funding talks right now. But we start off with correspondent Rich Edson at the State Department and a major move on immigration. Good evening, Rich. Now, good evening, Brett. And nearly 200,000 Salvadorans found out today that their protected status living here in the United States is about to run out. Donald Trump! Shame on you! Donald Trump! Shame on you! After nearly two decades of extensions, the Trump administration says it will allow Salvadorans' temporary protected status to expire, meaning Salvadorans who came to America after natural disasters in their homeland have a year and a half to leave the U.S. In January and February of 2001, two earthquakes in El Salvador killed more than 1,000 people. In March of that year, the Bush administration granted Salvadorans legal entrance into the U.S. under a humanitarian relief program that allows international victims of disasters and war to live and work in the U.S. until it's safe for them to return. Give TPS holders once and for all a path for citizenship. These are people who have been living with, by the rules. President Trump has phased out their protections far more aggressively than his predecessor. Administration officials contend El Salvador has recovered from the 2001 earthquakes and, as they did with Nicaraguans in November, argue it's time for those citizens to return home. The name itself explains a lot of it. Temporary protected status. So I believe the government looked at the situation there on the ground and assessed um, assess that it is no longer unsafe in, in that way. The Department of Homeland Security says it covers 10 countries under temporary protected status. The Trump administration has announced it's phasing out protections for Sudanese, Haitians and Nicaraguans, still reviewing the status of Hondurans and those from South Sudan. Citizens under these protections from Nepal, Somalia, Syria and Yemen have several months remaining before the administration must make a decision. Democrats and even some Republicans argue these Salvadorans over the past 17 years have built lives in the U.S. The potential implications in the hemisphere and particular in um, El Salvador uh, could affect us here in the mid to long term in a very negative sense. But I, I understand why they're doing it. Congressman diaz Balart also points out that many of these Salvadorans are raising children born here in the United States over the past 17 years. Those children are American citizens and there's still a danger in El Salvador, he says, from drug and gang violence. Brett. Rich Edson, live at the State Department. Rich, thank you. We are once again counting down the days, now 11, to a possible government shutdown. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is on Capitol Hill tonight with an update on the talks to try to prevent that and how immigration significantly fits in. Immigration reform and enforcement, the construction of a wall and border security, as well as dealing, as the president just said, with the issue of DACA. Tomorrow, President Trump and senior administration officials are expected to hold a bipartisan meeting with top congressional leaders to discuss immigration. There's about $18 billion to finish the southern border security. The president's absolutely committed to having that as part of a larger DACA agreement. But first things first, the government's due to run out of money late night Friday, January. January 19th, and that is the immediate priority for the White House. A budget deadline is not the time to be passing uh, other pieces of legislation, say on immigration or other issues. Uh, we want a clean funding bill that supports our national security priorities. 
Top Republican lawmakers say boosting defense spending is critical. It's been devastated by the cuts that have gone through on the Obama administration. As you saw, we had a national defense briefing from the CIA, Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Defense, General Mattis, going through of the challenges around the world and making sure that America is continued to be safe. Democrats and their liberal base argue their leverage is now, so they want to tie immigration to the budget deadline. And prominent liberals say they're okay with more border security. Let's do that. But the idea of spending some $18 billion on a wall that most people think will not do what he says it will do does not make any sense. Republicans note Senate Democrats supported more money for border security in 2013. The big difference seems to be terminology. Democrats do not want a border wall. Brett? Mike Emanuel, live on the Hill. Mike, thanks. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Ed Royce of California will not seek re-election. Royce now becomes the third committee chair in the GOP House majority to announce retirement plans since last Tuesday. Stocks were mixed today. The Dow lost 13. The S&P 500 gained 5. The Nasdaq was up 21, both setting record high closes for the fifth trading day in a row. President Trump is right now heading to the site of tonight's National College Football Championship game in Atlanta. A short time ago in Nashville, the president told a group of American farmers that for them, the American dream is roaring back to life. But there's plenty more on the president's table. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts has our report tonight. Good evening, John. As there is most days these days. Brett, good evening to you. The president was with a friendly group of farmers in Nashville today as he touted the, the effects of his policies on the family farm. And this, as his legal team prepares for a far more uncertain audience and a possible interview of the president by the special counsel, Robert Mueller. Agriculture, trade, and tax cuts were on top of President Trump's agenda today, speaking to the National Farm Bureau Federation Convention in Nashville, becoming the first sitting president in 25 years to address the group. We have been working every day to deliver for America's farmers, just as they work every single day to deliver for us. Today's speech followed a weekend retreat at Camp David, where the president huddled with his cabinet and Republican leadership to chart the policy course for 2018. Got a lot of work done, a lot of great work for the people. But the president was also dragged back into the Russia investigation and his fitness for office, spending part of that retreat responding to accusations in the new Michael Wolff book, Fire and Fury, that he is mentally unstable. The president tweeting the book is, quote, fake written by a totally discredited author. Just so you know, I never interviewed with him in the White House at all. He was never in the Oval Office. We didn't have an interview. And I guess uh, Sloppy Steve brought him into the White House quite a bit, and it was one of those things. That's why Sloppy Steve is now looking for a job. Sloppy Steve is President Trump's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, who caught the full force of the president's fury after appearing to slam Donald Trump Jr. in the new Wolf book, calling Trump Jr.'s meeting with a Russian attorney, quote, treasonous. Bannon issued a rare mea culpa yesterday in a statement to Fox News saying Donald Trump Jr. is both a patriot and a good man. He has been relentless in his advocacy for his father and the agenda that has helped turn our country around. Bannon insists he was not talking about Trump Jr. He was referring to former campaign manager Paul Manafort, a seasoned campaign professional with experience and knowledge of how the Russians operate. He should have known they are duplicitous, cunning, and not our friends. To reiterate, those comments were not aimed at Don Jr. This afternoon, aboard Air Force One, White House spokesman Hogan Gidley said Bannon may have cooked his own goose, telling reporters, quote, I don't believe there's any way back for Mr. Bannon at this point. It's very obvious that Mr. Mr. Bannon worked with Mr. Wolf in this particular book. At the same time, Fox News has learned the president's legal team is in preliminary discussions about a possible interview of the president by the special counsel's office. While there has not yet been a request for an interview, his legal team is anticipating Mueller may ask to speak to President Trump as part of a wrap-up to his investigation. At Camp David, President Trump repeated his months-old assertion he would be willing to talk to Mueller, and he also reaffirmed his innocence. There's been no collusion. There's been no crime, but we have been very open. We could have done it two ways. We could have been very close, and it would have taken years. But, you know, it's sort of like when you've done nothing wrong, let's be open and get it over with. 
Sources uh, say the president's legal team is looking at a number of options for a potential interview. One might be an in-person interview by the special counsel himself with a defined set of parameters going in. The other might be a series of written answers to questions that the special counsel submits or even an affidavit in which the president swears out his position on the case. There's also a very real possibility that none of this may happen. Though, Brett, the, uh, the sources say that uh, the president's legal team does expect that Robert Mueller will ask for an interview sometime in the next few weeks. Brett. John Roberts, live in the North Lawn. John, thanks. There is new fallout tonight from allegations of conflict of interest in the Justice Department investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harridge is here tonight with the latest details. Good evening, Catherine. Well, thank you, Brett. A senior Justice Department official with an apparent conflict over fusion G GPS, the firm behind the Trump dossier, has been demoted for a second time. Bruce Orr is no longer head of the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. He was stripped of his role as Associate Deputy Attorney General in December after Fox News reported Orr had meetings unknown to his superiors with the co-founder of Fusion GPS, former journalist Glenn Simpson, as well as former British spy Christopher Steele, who compiled the dossier research. It's not clear where Orr has landed, though he is still a Justice Department employee. Orr's wife, Nellie, is a Russia specialist who did research for the Trump project, which was funded by the DNC and Clinton campaign. As division head for organized crime, Orr was also directly involved with an interagency investigation that tracked a drug and money laundering scheme to Iran. Critics say the investigation and potential prosecutions were derailed by the Obama administration, fearing it would upset Iran leading up to the 2015 nuclear deal, or is scheduled to testify to the House Intelligence Committee behind closed doors January 17th. Brett. And Catherine, the House Committee is learning more about Fusion GPS is financials who got paid for the Russia work? Well, that's right. Fox News is told TD Bank complied with the House subpoena within hours of the court's decision, making any appeal moot. At issue are 70 transactions that cover clients, two media companies, journalists, and researchers over a two-year period. After last week's deal with Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein and FBI Director Christopher Wray, the committee also got access to the remaining FBI Russia documents during a classified session at the Justice Department. House investigators could take notes, but not hard copies. The documents were described to Fox News as core records about the dossier and is handling by the FBI, including witness interview summaries for confidential sources or informants known as 1023s. As events unfolded this weekend, President Trump said the evidence does not implicate his team. I guess the collusion now is dead because everyone found that after a year of study, there's been absolutely no collusion. There's been no collusion between us and the Russians. The House committee is scheduling another 10 interviews for later this month, including former FBI Director Comey's inner circle, as well as two Trump campaign aides, Brett. We'll follow it all. Catherine, thanks. You're welcome. President Trump may not be the only TV star running for the White House in 2020. Oprah Winfrey is said to be now considering a campaign. National correspondent William Lajeunesse tells us from Los Angeles we may have heard a preview of her pitch last night. A new day is on the horizon. Would she? Could she run? And when that new day finally dawns, it will be because of a lot of magnificent women. Oprah Winfrey triggered a political earthquake Sunday night in a speech that rumbled like the beginnings of a campaign. In the age of Trump, when we've seen that we can have a president without any political experience, there's no reason that Oprah shouldn't think that she could do this. The positives? I have one word, one name, and it's Oprah. For 25 years, Oprah was America's conscience as a daily talk show host. Tough but tender, inspiring, successful but generous. Oprah G. Winfrey is a global media icon. Politically, Winfrey could carry the Obama coalition without the baggage of his presidency. The challenge... I don't know if America is ready for a female president, let alone an African-American female president at that. On social media, users have already adopted Oprah 2020. We all know that the press is under siege these days. Winfrey, a sexual abuse survivor, told 20 million viewers sexual harassment and inequality exist beyond the glamour of Hollywood. They're the women whose names we'll never know. They are domestic workers and farm workers. Friends close to Winfrey reportedly say she's actively considering a run for the Democratic nomination, although seven months ago she told a podcast. I will never run for public office. 
Okay, that's a pretty definitive... That's a pretty definitive thing. Okay. Last night, however, Winfrey's partner, Stedman Graham, told the LA Times it's up to the people. She would absolutely do it. If Winfrey were to run, she'd enter what is expected to be a wide-open Democratic field. But for now, we'll just have to let the speculation continue. Right. William, thank you. The U.S. Supreme Court is refusing to hear a pair of cases challenging Mississippi's law, allowing government workers and private business people to cite their religious beliefs in denying services to LGBT people. Justices ruled the plaintiffs did not have legal standing to challenge the law because they did not show they had suffered actual harm or direct harm. However, we're also told other cases on this issue will likely make their way to the highest court. 2017 was the costliest year ever for weather disasters in this country. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says the U.S. had 16 disasters costing at least $1 billion apiece. Leading the way, Hurricane Harvey at $125 billion. The total price tag for the year, $306 billion for disasters. Critics are now openly charging that President Trump is losing it, not fit. He says he's actually a stable genius. We'll take a look at the charges and get reaction from Britt Hume when we come back. A source close to Mitt Romney says the former Republican presidential nominee was treated for prostate cancer last summer. Source saying Romney's surgery was successful and his prognosis is good. Romney has been mentioned as possibly running for the seat of retiring Utah Senator Orrin Hatch. We have new information tonight on the investigation into the wife of former Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders. A federal grand jury has heard testimony from a former trustee at the college where Jane O'Mara Sanders was president. The Obama Justice Department launched a probe into allegations Jane Sanders committed bank fraud, fraud and that her husband used his Senate office to help the school get a loan that eventually led to its demise. We'll continue to follow this case. Former Democratic Congressman Dennis Kucinich has filed some paperwork to run for governor of Ohio. Kucinich ran for president twice and was, until today, a Fox News contributor. He is one of several prospective entries in the race to succeed Republican Governor John Kasich, who cannot run again because of term limits. As we told you earlier, President Trump is fighting back against allegations that he is working with a diminished mental capacity, that he is somehow unfit, a lot of it coming from this new book that had Washington talking last week. The president says, as a matter of fact, he's a genius and a stable one at that. Here's correspondent Doug McElwain. Republicans are pledged to restore and revitalize. It is informally called the Goldwater Rule, a section of the American Psychiatric Association's guidelines that says it is unethical for a psychiatrist to offer a professional opinion unless he or she has conducted an examination. It was spurred by Barry Goldwater's run for president in 1964, and psychiatrists as a, as a group were opposed to him, and so they made diagnoses about him that were based on psychoanalytic principles, which we don't use today. 53 years later, Yale University psychiatrist Dr. Bandy X. Lee met with 11 Democratic lawmakers and told them that President Trump is mentally unfit for office. Dr. Lee says she's nonpartisan and didn't break the Goldwater rule, but rather felt compelled to intervene due to a present danger for the general public. The president took to the very forum that Dr. Lee suggested as part of his problem. He tweeted, my two greatest assets have been mental stability and being like really smart and a very stable genius at that. The president's senior aides also fought back on the Sunday talk shows. But I'm with him almost every day. He asks really difficult questions of our team at CIA so that we can provide him the information that he needs to make good information foreign policy decisions. The president's tweets absolutely reaffirmed the plain spoken truth. A self-made billionaire revolutionized reality TV and tapped into something magical that's happening in the hearts of this country. The controversy has raised uncomfortable questions about mixing psychiatry with politics. In fact, there have been studies of psychologists and psychiatrists as, as a group, and they, they definitely do learn, lean left of center. In a country where political divisions are so deep, some fear that could lead to the weaponization of psychiatry. It's very dangerous. I've railed against the criminalization of political difference. It's getting worse. In fact, it's already happening. In August, Democratic Congressman Zoe Lofgren introduced a resolution urging the cabinet to have the president examined by a team of psychiatrists. And many Democrats will again be meeting with Dr. Bandy X. Lee this week. 
Brett? Doug, thank you. Let's get reaction to the arguments over the president and his state of mind from senior political analyst Britt Hume. Good evening, Britt. Uh, your thoughts on all this? Hi, Brett. Well, it's pretty bizarre to see this unfolding now. Um, after all, if you look at Donald Trump's behavior going back decades, the one thing about it is that it's consistent. One might argue stable. He's always acted the way he acts now. He's always been thin-skinned. He's always been remarkably childlike in his reactions to things. And that's playing out in his presidency. And you can make a case, Brett, if, as, if you were a Trump critic, that he is temperamentally unsuited to the job. But temperamentally unsuited is not the same as mentally unfit, and it certainly isn't the same as mentally unstable. Uh, but this is the argument that you hear, and it's doing the reputation of the psychiatrists, or psychiatrists, plural, involved, no good that they are, despite their denials, palpably violating the, the, uh, the Goldwater rule, which is, as uh, Doug was reporting, uh, makes it unethical to make armchair diagnoses, which all of these critiques of the president's mental health seem to be exactly that, armchair diagnoses, probably I mean, not worth much. You know, this, the president's supporters say this is who he was on the campaign, and this is who he was through the primaries, and this is who he was in the general election to get elected in the U.S. And um, I guess they're pushing back saying he was elected and it hasn't changed much. Yeah, people, yeah, people, yeah, people had a sense of him. I think that's a, that's, that's a reasonable interpretation. And if you, and if you look at, at what's happening here, I mean, in his career, if he were mentally unstable, unfit, he could not, despite all of his flamboyance, despite all of his boastfulness, despite all of this stuff that we all see in him day by day, he could not have built the business that he built and had the career that he had. Nor could, I, I, could one imagine that he could have pulled off this astonishing feat of getting himself elected president of the United States. This is simply not what happens to somebody who's mentally unstable, in my, in my, in my estimation, and experience. So, you know, you can look at him and say, well, you know, he, you know, his behavior is unorthodox. It certainly is. They say it violates norms. It certainly does. Uh, but this is who he is. And it doesn't really add up to a case that he's mentally unfit for office or unstable, in my estimation anyway. Britt, as always, thank you. Thank you, Brett. Up next, North Korea and South Korea try to avoid nuclear war ahead of the Olympics. We'll tell you what's really behind those protests in Iran. Stay tuned. We are awaiting the start of historic negotiations between the two Koreas. The stated topic, next month's Olympics, but there's a lot more on the table. Senior Foreign Affairs correspondent Greg Palcott is in Seoul tonight. Talks aimed at thawing frigid relations between North and South Korea are set to start in the coming hours. The first formal high-level negotiations in over two years will be held in Panmunjom on the DMZ. Primarily aimed at discussing North Korea's participation in next month's Winter Olympics in South Korea, Seoul hopes they go beyond. We expect the discussions to focus on mutual interest of improving North-South relations. Kim Jong-un does too. Ever since his New Year's message, he's been talking up closer ties with the South while keeping his missiles trained on the U.S. Some fear the North is trying to drive a wedge between the South and the U.S. or that Seoul could give away too much. Still, the Pentagon did delay U.S.-South Korean joint military exercises until after the Olympics, as requested by the South. And President Trump's recent references to the talks have been generally positive. If South Korea is opening a channel that can have positive indirect effects to make it easier for the Americans to start talking to the North Koreans at a senior level. Washington's caveat for U.S.-North Korea talks is a halt in nuclear and missile testing by the North. French President Macron is also pushing substantive negotiations. Today he visited with Chinese President Xi while in Beijing. We exert pressure on Pyongyang together so that the regime goes back to the negotiating table and will then show that the notion of collective security is credible. After a nervous 2017, the folks in Seoul are simply hoping for more talk and less provocative action in the region. I'm very hopeful. I believe communication is necessary whenever for whatever issue. And even Trump is supporting the issue right now, from what I know. 
The word that we are now getting is that the South Korean delegation is approaching the DMZ. The session is set to begin in 90 minutes time. By the way, Kim Jong-un's birthday was on Monday. It remains to be seen whether we'll get any belated birthday presents from this foray into diplomacy. Right. Greg Palcott live Tuesday morning in Seoul. Greg, thanks. As the Trump administration and the president continue to shine light on anti-government protests inside Iran, Iran's foreign minister is warning neighboring countries against supporting those protests that have rocked the Islamic Republic over the past two weeks. Let's talk about the current situation and what could be next. Norman Rule is the former Iran mission manager for the director of national intelligence, who before that spent more than 30 years at the CIA working on Middle East issues. And Kareem Sajapur is an Iranian-American policy analyst at the Carnegie Endowment. Thanks for being here, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Norm, let me ask you first, where are we now? We can't get a real great sense of where these protests are on the ground. Well, social media has certainly been constrained by Iran's choking off of the Internet. However, it's probable that, that uh, these unrest continue, that continues and arrests are continuing right now as the Iranians pick up the protesters, the instigators, and the people who organize the protest. Iran is also gradually starting to open up the Internet, but they'll be careful to do so, uh, fearing that doing so would allow unrest to increase. Karim, uh, the administration, the Iranian administration, the foreign ministry saying uh, if the Iran deal is scrapped, quote, uh, appropriate and heavy response by the Iranians to the U.S., and that the U.S. administration will definitely regret it. That's coming out today. They're already charging that the U.S. is essentially behind these protests on the ground. The, whenever there are popular protests in Iran, the Iranian government always blames it on outside powers, whether it's the United States, Israel, or more recently, Saudi Arabia. The reality is that Iran is a young population, a population of 80 million people, and there's tremendous economic discontent, but also social and political discontent. But I, I think the, the, the fact remains that this is a regime which has four decades of brutality, and they are committed to staying in power. They don't have a lot of popular support, but they're quite united. The security forces are quite united. And I'd say society, in contrast, they're deeply discontent, but they're somewhat divided about what they want. And I think bottom line is that, I say in 1979, Iranians experienced a revolution without democracy, and today they seek democracy without a revolution. Norm, it's not like we saw in 2009, at least not yet, as far as the protests on the streets, but is the, the sense that the regime has lost some cred with its own people? Absolutely. And in fact, what's important is the protesters represent the basic constituency of the Supreme Leader, of Rouhani, of Ahmadinejad, and in some cases of the Green Path movement. The, the protesters didn't have an actual leader. And one must wonder, if there were an actual leader, what would have happened to these protests? Would they have grown significantly? The numbers were certainly smaller than 2009, 2009. But they were spread over such a geography that this must have been a terrible problem for the regime to confront. And it's different for this administration, this president speaking out, uh, this administration speaking out, a good thing as far as you see? I think it is a good thing. It's important that we don't ally ourselves directly with the uh, demonstrators or any aspect of the movement. Iran would use that to crush them and to paint them with the U.S. Uh, hand. At the same time, we should stand up for the right of protesters to peacefully express their political feelings and stand up also against oppressive regimes who, 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 who uh, put these people in jail. And it's important that we stand stand up now for the many Iranians who are imprisoned by the security forces. You know, you recently, Kareem, uh, wrote about uh, Iran's cyber capabilities. Mm -hmm. Not only are they funding terrorists throughout the region, but they're also doing some pretty um, aggressive things on online. Yeah, one of the findings of our cyber report was that Iran isn't a first-tier cyber power. It's not like the United States or Russia or China. We call it a third-tier cyber power. But they've been very effective at preying on fifth-tier cyber powers, so countries like Saudi Arabia, um, UAE, countries which don't really have an advanced cyber program or weren't paying attention, or even financial institutions. You know, Iran managed to hack, I think, JP Morgan embezzled some money. So that's one of the things that Iran does well. It's and they can black out inside their own country. Yes, and I think this is a very key aspect of the protest. They can throttle the internet when they want to inhibit communications, when they want to inhibit information. And I think that for the United States, 
That's what's key, is you want to do everything in your power to prevent Iran's ability to, to have a communications and information blackout. For the rest of the global community, and you see Europe, Norm, kind of taking a hands-off approach, uh, saying, let's, let's wait and see how this comes out. One German leader said, we don't know who the white hats are here. Um, wh what do you say to that? Well, look, clearly the protesters are in the right. Clearly the protesters have valid grievances, and clearly this is a repressive government. And it's important for the world to stand up, the United States and its partners, with these people who are fighting for their freedom. At the same time, it's important that we, as we approach this uh, uh, problem in the days after that we have a common approach with our European partners and our regional allies. We should be doing everything we can to push information technology into Iran so that Iran is unable to crack down on the Internet in the inevitable future protests. But Norm, what do you think heavy and appropriate response to getting out of the Iran deal means for the Iranians? It's, it's rhetoric. The Iranians must have investments to, to sustain the uh, foundations of the regime. An absence of foreign investment means a weakening of the Iranian regime itself. It, the JCPOA is in Iran's interest. Now, to be clear, the JCPOA also provides us with unprecedented insight into the program because of the IAEA and allows us to freeze the program for a period of time. Okay. Kareem, Norm, I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Brett. The president is kicking out 200,000 Salvadoran immigrants as immigration also plays a big part in talks to avoid a government shutdown. We'll talk about all of this with the panel when we return. We are going to end chain migration. We are going to end the lottery system. And we are going to build the wall. And now I think it's our responsibility to protect those young men and women because it's really a fight not only for dreamers today, but for a real sense of fairness in the United States of America. Immigration, now the key issue in the talks about funding the government, this as temporary protection status is coming to an end for a number of countries. Now announced today, El Salvador, almost 200,000 people uh, expiring September of next year. Honduras, 57,000, expires July 5th, 2018. Haiti, 46,000. Nepal, Syria, there you see, those are also 2018 expiration for uh, temporary protection, essentially meaning that the, people, the immigrants could come here uh, and stay inside the U.S. The DHS, Department of Homeland Security, saying the original conditions caused by 2001 earthquakes in El Salvador no longer exist. So it's coming to an end and it's sparking a lot of reaction. Let's bring in our panel, Steve Hayes, editor-in-chief of the Weekly Standard, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist, and Charles Lane, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Let's start, Steve, with this uh, TPS, temporary protection status. Um, the administration is saying, hey, listen, it's, it's over. El Salvador can take the people back. Uh, for different lawmakers, they're saying, well, wait a second. They've been here almost 20 years, and they've established themselves and their families. Right. Well, Milton Friedman said there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program, and I think this is evidence that, that he's right. Uh, it, this, is a, this is a program that was put in as an emergency measure. It's been on the books now for 18 years, as you suggested in the intro. Um, the conditions that caused it in the first place, these dual uh, earthquakes, are no longer in existence. And the justification for it, I think, has shifted quite obviously, and its proponents are not even really pretending that the, the, the justification has shifted. Look, Donald Trump ran for office saying he was going to change immigration laws and change them in a pretty dramatic way to make them more restrictive. That's what he's doing here. Nobody should be surprised that he's trying to do this. Um, and I, I think the uh, the objections are, are pretty tough to justify at this point. Uh, one of the Republican uh, uh, Mario Diaz, Diaz Balart uh, saying, I'm in strong disagreement with the administration's decision. While living conditions may have slightly improved. El Salvador now faces a significant problem with drug trafficking, gangs, and crime. Since 2001, these people have established themselves in the United States, making countless contributions to our society and our local communities. It would be devastating to send them home after they have created a humble living for themselves and their families. I strongly urge the administration to reconsider this decision. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. 
Well, the United States is a wonderful country, and it is a much better place to live than a lot of places on Earth. But as Steve points out, this is a temporary program. It's like how we talk about DACA. The D in DACA stands for delayed action. Americans have been told that these are programs that are temporary, that they're not permanent, and then they're sort of a large bait and switch, where after decades they say, well, now there's nothing you can do. To me, this points to the much larger problem of our immigration policy, which is not very coherent, which doesn't think through what the needs of the country are and how they match with the citizens. and. Unfortunately, we're just not having a very good conversation about it. There really are lots of conflicts here. There's the rule of law. There's what the country needs. There are the needs of immigrants. And there are the ways that immigrants help countries and the way that they hurt. And nobody's having a good conversation. Chuck. Well, in a way, I give the president some credit for precipitating an issue that has been allowed to sort of roll over somewhat mindlessly for many years. And as my colleagues have already said, outstripping the original purpose of this temporary grant of status. Having said that, I also don't think it's very realistic to talk about returning so many people to El Salvador, in effect, over the next 18 months. And the reason I say that is it could be a total of about 400,000, uh, sorry, uh, it's, it's 200,000 uh, temporary departure people, but they seem to have at least 100,000 children among them, many of whom are U.S. citizens. It's, that's a, a big problem in and of itself. And I suspect a lot of them are going to attempt to stay here some other way. They're going to try to get a legal status, and a lot of them will just stay illegally if they can't find a legal means. So what I hope is going to come out of this is that, in effect, sort of like he tried to do with DACA, the president's put Congress on notice. They've got 18 months to come up with something permanent that makes sense for these folks. And I would say to Representative diaz Ballard, that's your... That's your job. Right. Uh, speaking of that, it is the central issue now on this uh, government funding uh, negotiation. Here is um, Mick Mulvaney on DACA. There is $1.6 billion in the request for this year. That's the 2018 funding bill that we have to take up before the end of the January. There's about $18 billion to finish the southern border security. The president is absolutely committed to having that as part of a larger DACA agreement. So it's really two pieces, $1.6 billion for some money for some wall this year, and then a larger agreement for the entire wall for the entire border security package as part of DACA. Can Democrats, Steve, get to a place where they don't give President Trump will win. They give him some security. They kind of punt the issue down the road a little bit about the wall, and they somehow come up with an agreement. Well, Democrats are deeply divided on this. I mean, you've got the progressive left that doesn't want to even have this conversation. Then I think you've got more pragmatic Democrats that are willing to, to try to find some solution. And, you know, it's a, it's a, a good guess as to who's going to win that debate. I think that the most likely outcome is that the give will be in how we define wall. What does a wall mean? It's not going to be a permanent structure that that spans the 2,000 miles of the southern border. It will be a combination of uh, cyber defenses and uh, fences and the existing wall or, or the existing border protections, which uh, cover some 654 miles of the 2,000 already, and that that will be the give. I mean, that's where I think is that good part enough the for the president's base? And after a campaign of Mexico is going to play pay for the wall, we're going to get the wall. There's different pieces of the wall that are already up to look at. The president reportedly is going to go look at them along the border. Is that good enough? I don't know exactly, but what really needs to happen is looking at our immigration policy dramatically differently. And we keep on having these problems where every few years we need to have amnesty for hundreds of thousands of people. We need to change at the outset so that we can, and there's no reason why it can't be win-win for everybody, really, border security and helping people who are here illegally. Quickly, um, it, it could be another punt. January 19th to whatever it is, March, end of March, to, to come up with some big deal. On the spending. On the spending. That's true. Although yeah. the clock is really ticking on, on DACA itself, which I think expires in March. And as to your original question, is it good enough for the base? It can be if the president finds a way to pitch it that way. And he can already claim that uh, illegal crossings uh, in Mexico are way down in his presidency. He could declare victory himself, but I think he is very fixated on that physical wall. And Mexico is not paying for Mexico the wall. Mexico is not paying for the wall. Or an invisible wall. <laughs> Next up, Oprah for president.
2011, I told some jokes about our current president at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, jokes about how he was unqualified to be president, and some have said that night convinced him to run. So if that's true, I just want to say, Oprah, you will never be president. I want to say that I value the press more than ever before. Speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. Now that speech at the Golden Globes had tongues wagging in liberal circles. NBC actually posted a tweet, later deleted, saying nothing but respect for our future president. Uh, Stedman Graham, uh, the significant other of Oprah, told the LA Times, Quote, it's up to the people, but she would absolutely do it about a possible 2020 run. You may remember this from 1988. This, this sounds like political presidential talk to me, and I know people have talked to you about whether or not you want to run. Would you, would you ever? Well, I just probably wouldn't do it, Oprah. I probably wouldn't, but I do get tired of seeing what's happening with this country, and if it got so bad, I would never want to rule it out totally, because I really am tired of seeing what's happening with this country, how we're, how we're really making other people live like kings, and we're not. I just don't think I really have the inclination to do it. I love what I'm doing. I really like it. Also, I, it doesn't pay as well. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Well, he did. Will she? We're back with the panel. Molly. Yeah, well, it seems this is where we are now, where people want to have celebrities as presidents. And uh, I think a lot of Democrats think that the only way to combat the rise of a powerful TV personality to the White House is to get a bigger, better TV personality to run against him. Uh, but I, I think that um, it's also funny that we've been hearing from so many establishment figures about how ridiculous it is to vote for someone who's a TV celebrity and mocking Trump voters for wanting someone outside, uh, outside the normal uh, type of politician. And here we have had the whole day people have just been gushing about the prospect of an Oprah candidacy. And it's just funny that if they think that Donald Trump is so unqualified, why they are willing to set that all aside for Oprah. It is quite something to watch, the Oprah mania. Yeah, well, I was uh, crammed on to a, a, a flight last night with small children and didn't have a chance to see the Golden Globes. <laughs> I had a much better go of it than anybody who had to watch that. Um, it, it is funny. I mean, you know, years ago, I think it was the mid 1980s, 1985, Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And the thesis of the book was that we trivialize, um, particularly mass media and television, trivialize the important issues in the country and in the world by turning them all into entertainment. And I was, I didn't love the book when I first read it because I thought it made some sort of um, anti capitalist arguments that didn't ring true. But I think Neil Postman turns out maybe to have been more correct than I thought at the time. Uh, Hogan Gidley on Air Force One did a press gaggle. He was asked if the president saw the speech and what he thought of the speech. And he responded, regardless who decides to run against this president, they're going to have to face a president who has a record setting achievements and record setting time, whether it's an economy that is booming, job creation, historic tax, cut, tax cuts, tax reform when they hadn't been touched in 30 years, an increase in wages, an absolute decimation of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. We welcome the challenge, whether it be Oprah Winfrey or anybody else. And the press said, we asked you about the speech. Did he see the speech? <laughs> so obviously there's a sensitivity to yes. Oprah running, maybe. Well, I saw the speech and I read the speech and it was a pretty good barn burner of a speech. And uh, you know, it was obviously pitched to a very receptive audience. I mean, that was, you know, Hollywood in pure condensed form. Look, uh, I am somebody who sat here on this show and laughed at the idea of Donald Trump running for president, so I'm not going to laugh at the idea of Oprah Winfrey running for president. I'm not going to make that mistake twice. Uh, this is a woman who's made a fortune convincing people to buy stuff from everything from Ugg boots to books to soup now. And she is good at that because she's persuasive, she radiates empathy, uh, and she validates the public. I don't know, those are the qualities of a good politician. All right, the tape's running, yes or no, she get in? I don't think she will get in. I think she's having too much fun to, uh, to throw it all away on the presidency. Free cars for everyone. She's going to run. <laughs> you get college. You get college. You get college. <laughs> All right, panel, we're going to play back the tape sometime. When we get back, turkeys take a stand, sending humans running.
Well, tonight it is not rain nor sleet nor snow preventing about 20 families in Cleveland from receiving their mail. A flock of wild turkeys has moved into that neighborhood, moved in about a month ago, terrorizing anyone who gets too close. They kind of lower their head and get some speed going towards you to make sure you know they mean business. They are not afraid of us, and it's like this is their neighborhood now. You have to have wild turkey to get the mail there. Residents have to trot down to the post office to get their mail because the turkeys have the law on their side. A local ordinance there prevents anyone from trying to get the flock out of there. Thanks for inviting us into your home tonight. That's it for this special report. Fair, balanced, and unafraid. The